So good afternoon. Welcome to the Museum of the Abermall. We are delighted that everyone has joined us today, whether at home or here at the Museum of the Abermall. We're just excited that we're at 100% now. And we just welcome everyone back to the museum. If you're um, at home today, we do invite you to join us for our next History for Lunch, which will be coming up um, not the next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after that, where we'll be doing the 1960s program. So we invite you to please join us. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started today. Today, from all the way from the Outer Banks, we have Mr. James Charlet. And in fact, Mr. Charlet was scheduled for last May, and we're just able to bring him back here to the museum for his um, talk on his book. And the books are available in the museum shop, Shipwrecks of the Outer Banks. Um, Mr. Charlet will be available after our talk today too, if you would like a signed copy. But we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get started today. And again, we would just like to welcome Mr. Charlet, welcome our people at home and welcome our visitors here in the museum too. So Mr. Charlet, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Lori. Good noontide to all you folks out here and uh, out there as well. My name is Keeper James, I'm a storyteller. The United States Life Saving Service is one of the least known yet most inspirational aspects in all of American history, yet so few people know about it. In fact, I say you could stop 100 people on the street anywhere in America except Elizabeth City and ask them, have you ever heard of the United States Life Saving Service? In 98 or 99, you're gonna say no. What this service was and who these men was is most succinctly expressed in the opening paragraph of an authoritative book on the subject by Ralph Shanks. And I'd like to read that quote. I also quoted it in my book. Ralph says, they were the greatest heroes of the American coast routinely risking their lives in the grand maritime rescues. Their work was respected and honored by America's most prestigious leaders, celebrated in the most popular publications of their time, and of deep interest to medical, educational, political, and religious leaders. The Wright brothers knew them well. The poet Walt Whitman wrote of them, and the artist Winslow Homer painted them. But somehow, America forgot these peaceful heroes. Now, the author Shanks goes on with more, but I'm going to interrupt him and say this, because it adds so much more weight to this quote. In the 44-year history of this service nationwide, the men of the United States Life Saving Service responded to over 178,000 lives in peril from the sea, of which they saved over 177,000. But somehow, America forgot. And keep in mind that the dire circumstances under which these resp responses are happening. We're talking in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, early 1900s, small open wooden boats, high seas, heavy storm winds. The only protection they had were cork life belts. Their own loss of life under these extremely dangerous circumstances, rescuing total strangers, less than 1%. But somehow, America has forgotten these heroes. It's just unbelievable. That is what inspired me to write this book. And it's more, it's not the, the publishers chose the title. That, that was not the title I chose. It's a little misleading because it's not really about shipwrecks. Well, I mean, it is. But it's about what happens after the shipwrecks. I, I'm more focused on the rescues by the, the United States Life Service Service. But not only. So what I want to do now is kind of give you a brief summary of what this service was. The, all of chapter one in my book does this. So this is gonna be a, a very much a synopsis of that. But what it was, was the predecessor of today's Coast Guard. 
It existed, as I said earlier, from 1871 until 1915, and I'll get to why, what happened then. Um, the service existed on all of America's coast. The Atlantic is where it started. Some st uh, stations on the, the Gulf of Mexico, a few on the Great Lakes, quite a few on our fourth coastline, which a lot of people forget about, is the Great Lakes. Oh yeah. Um, but in that year, 18, in 1915, the United States Life Saving Service, which had this singular mission of being land-based ocean rescue, merged with the United States Revenue Cutter Service, which had the singular mission of ocean-based law enforcement to form today's Coast Guard. Um, what these people did, it was an extremely regimented service. The, the one and only superintendent, Sumner Kemnell, was, was the, uh, the highlight of a, the most efficient bureaucrat you can imagine. And so what he did was organize extremely well. And every station in the nation did everything the same way every day. They had a very regimented uh, six-day work week. And here's basically how it went. And again, the book goes through all of this in detail in chapter two. Um, but on Mondays, they did the beach apparatus drill. That takes a little explanation. And again, it's a, it's a very complicated thing to say in words. It's not complicated when you see it, but just so you can picture what it is, is basically a small mortar called the Lyle gun fires a 20, 20 pound projectile with a very thin line attached to it. The objective of that is to fire that projectile over the stricken ship, which is ho hopefully just three, four, five hundred yards offshore. If that's the case, then that line falls into the rigging. Someone on board the ship, the lifesavers don't leave the beach in this case. Someone on board the ship retrieves that line. That line is what sailors call a messenger line, which means this piece of rope is not important to me, but what's tied to it on the other end is. And what they're pulling in is a much heavier line, which we couldn't fire with the projectile. That's why we use a thin line to begin with. And so what that line does is it has a, a, a pulley attached to it. We can now attach this to the ship mast, hopefully, if it still exists. And if you think of grandma's old clothesline, now you've got a line running through a pulley attached to the ship, to the shore. So we can put something on one line and send it to the ship and then pull it back to shore. And so what we're pulling back to shore is a small lifesaver. Uh, with, with pants sewn into it called the breeches buoy. And so we're taking one person at a time off of these ships. As antiquated as that sounds, that system was so efficient that it was still in use by the United States Coast Guard. The last time it was used by the United States Coast Guard was in a movie that you may have seen with Chris Pine. And that was in 1964. That's not that long ago. I remember the, the lyrics of songs from 1964. So it's not that long ago. Uh, so we did that, that drill on Mondays. On Tuesdays, we did the surfboat drill, launching the surfboat, which doesn't sound like it's much of a deal. But when you, if, if you're on Hatteras Island, where I am, that's the most intense surf on the East Coast. And you ask any surfer today, how long does it take you to get past those breakers? Sometimes it can take hours just to get past the breakers. There's that much energy. So launching a, a, a wooden boat like that is, uh, is difficult. And uh, so they practice that every Tuesday. On Wednesday, they practice uh, flag signaling, which again was a means of communication. And I just learned something myself, which is kind of fascinating. I'd always heard that they, they did the semaphore flags and we know what those are. But we all, they also did wigwam flags. And I thought, what the heck is that? And it was a, 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 a very early method of a binary numbers. You had a red flag and a white flag. And I'm oversimplifying this, but like if you put the left, the white flag to the left one time, that's the letter A. The red flag to the right one time, that's the letter B. Go two times to this way, that's C, et cetera. So you could do the whole alphabet that way. And how in the world you could keep up with how many times that was done, I don't know, but that's what they did. That was the wigwam. On uh, Thursdays, they repeated the beach apparatus drill, shows you how important that was. One interesting thing about that, that I find fascinating, it says so much about the service. 
is that an inspector went around constantly from one station to the next. If an inspector happened to be at your station when you're doing the drill, from the time the keeper said action, that means you start setting everything up, fire the gun, bring the person back from the ship. And they had a practice poll where they simulated the ship. From, from the time the keeper said action until the, the, that part, the first uh, survivor hit the sand, if that group it, uh, uh, exceeded five minutes, that group, of, that crew of the station was not subject to discipline they were subject to dismissal. No do-overs when it comes to saving lives. So that's Sumner Kimball. On Fridays, we did uh, practice first aid, which is kind of interesting. These were the only people in these villages that had any, any medical knowledge. Uh, Saturdays was maintenance. Sundays, you had the day off, but you were on call. And you literally could not go past the sound of the station bell to be called back. Uh, the duties, every, every station had six lifesavers called surfmen, and they were ranked one through six, later expanded to eight. And the guy in charge of each lifesaving station was called the keeper. Now, that always causes me problems because the typical American, and I was one of them, I understand that, when you hear the word keeper, oh, that's the guy in charge of the lighthouse. Well, yes, but so was the guy in charge of the lifesaving station was called the keeper. So... Often I get confused with the lighthouse service, which is a totally different thing. Um, and what, uh, what they did, each, each uh, station had uh, these duties for each surfman, including the keeper. Uh, one, the, the primary duty was standing watch. Every station had a tower. Usually the tower was built on the, the roof of the station. Typically they were enclosed. The very first stations had an open platform with a pole to hold on to in case of high wind. <laughs> so they realized pretty soon that wasn't quite enough. And when, when, when they said standing watch, um, I used to enjoy being in the watchtower of the Chicken Macomco station. And when people would come up and I'd say, you see how this is furnished? This is exactly period correct. And they'd look at me like, what? There's nothing in there. There's no, <laughs> so you stand the watch. You literally can do not sit down. Uh, and it's up to the keeper whether you rotate people to do that or have one person. But the watch was kept every day from sunrise to sunset. Now, back in the day, before all this development, by, and, and I can only speak of the service and the stations on the North Carolina coast, so all of my facts are, are, are restricted to that. By 1900, we had 29 stations along our coast. They were averaging about four to five, six miles apart. And back in those days, if you were in the watchtower of, of my station, Chickamacomico, I could look to the south and I could see the next station south, Gulf Shoals, and I could see the next station to the north, P. Island. So we had the beaches covered. But that's not going to work at night or in days of heavy rain or fog or that kind of thing, storms. So at that time, you have what's called beach patrol. And every station sent out at the time of the watch, and it gets a little complicated, so I'm going to skip that, but there were four different watches. And at the time of the watch, every station sent out two surfmen. On our island, our island, we only had three directions. There's north, south, and wet. Are you with me on that? <laughs> okay. So um, once one surfman would go north, one surfman would go south. You're walking the, the beat. What you're doing is looking for potential shipwrecks, where you're looking for actual shipwrecks or potential shipwrecks. And by that, I mean, it's easy to spot a real shipwreck. But what the Life Saving Service did, the Life Saving Service on Beach Patrol probably saved more ships than the Lighthouse Service. And here's why. When they're on patrol and they saw they're on the beach 24-7, we have those beaches covered. We see every ship every time under every circumstance. Doesn't matter what the weather's like, we're out there. I have a photo back home, and I wish I should have brought it, of a, a, these typical stations had, the, the guys would pose in their uniforms in front of the station, they're all lined up. And frequently you see handwritten scrawled on it. And this is a, the station of um, Creed's Hill, just uh, south of, of us. And it lists all the men, and it gets to number seven, and gives his name and says, 
killed and struck by lightning while in beach patrol. <laughs> and yet, <clears throat> this is what these, <clears throat> excuse me, these heroes are doing <clears throat> that America <clears throat> has forgotten. So what we would do on beach patrol, if we see a ship too close to shore, we fire a flare. We wave our land and we go, watch out, you're too close, get away. And that worked 99% of the time. So if we did spot an actual shipwreck, we also do something else. We send, a, we send a different colored flare. That flare does several things. It tells the people on board the ship, the shipwreck, we see you, help is coming, please stay on board. The, the most natural tendency, and I would be one of them, is to get the heck out of there. You've got 20, 30 foot waves and the ship is coming apart literally. And, and what you wanna do is jump off of there. More deaths and injuries were caused by people leaving the ship than any other cause. If they were to stay on the ship, the life saving service is gonna get there and they're gonna get you off before that ship goes away. Uh, that flare also does two other things. It tells the guys that are on beach patrol but we got a wreck, you need to get back. And it also tells the, the station that's going to respond to the wreck, get ready to go out. Uh, so those were the, um, the duties that each one had. Um, that's basically what the, uh, and again, uh, a very quick synopsis of the service itself. What I want to do next is kind of go over what I did in, in this book. Sorry, there too. Uh, there are other books on shipwrecks and even some on the life saving service. And what most of them have done is either a chronological order, this shipwreck occurred and then the next one in there. And I thought that's kind of boring. And then there's another, I've seen other ones where they just listed them alphabetically and I thought, I don't quite get that. So I decided to uh, think about a, a table of contents and do this somewhat differently. What I decided to do was to create sections uh, section one is the background. I talk about the service, chapter one, and where it happened, the Graveyard of the Atlantic. And I explain what the Graveyard of the Atlantic is. I came up with uh, 12 different factors that account for why it's the Graveyard of the Atlantic. And I'm not going to go into those now, but they're in the book. Um, chapter, uh, the second section is, is called the well-known shipwrecks, the ones that most people have heard about. Um, for instance, chapter three is the, the Merlot, chapter four, Rasmus Midget and the Priscilla, chapter five, Richard Etheridge and the E.S. Newman. Those are very common, and a lot of people know them. And uh, let me just give you a brief idea of, of how dramatic these stories can get. Um, and, and I mean, this is a very small part of chapter three about the, re the rescue of the Merlot. This happened at Chickamacomico, the station I was at for a long time. I'm going right to the, the heart of it. This is August of 1918. This is the end of World War I, near the end of World War I. Now, a lot of people get World War I and II mixed up. World War II was the one with John Wayne. This is earlier, doesn't get a lot of coverage, not a lot of movies. Um, a ship, the British ship tanker SS Merlo, was seven miles offshore of the station of Chickamacomico. When, when it exploded. There were actually three explosions. And again, I go into a lot of detail in the book about this, but the third explosion literally ripped the Merlot in two, releasing its cargo, all of its cargo, which was 6,679 tons of high octane aviation fuel and gasoline and other petroleum products. And guess what, boys and girls, gasoline floats on top of the water and it burns on top of the water. It ignited the size of the inferno. And of course it's spreading like lightning. The size of that inferno, I still, I really can't imagine how big that was. I do know that one of the local newspapers it may have been the Daily Advance. Their headline was, Ocean Catches Fire. I mean, our mind can't conceive of such a thing. Captain Johnny, the, the uh, officer in charge, the keeper of this station, had five men on duty that day. They launched surf boat 1046. It takes them a half hour to launch the boat. The surf is so heavy. When they get out to the, past the breakers, they see a small white boat, lifeboat, 
full of people and a wall of flames. They get to that light, but they find out these are some of the survivors of the Merlot, which had a crew of 51. And they tell Captain Johnny, most of our, the rest of our, our comrades are behind that wall of flames. Get out there as fast as you can. And Captain Johnny assures them that's what they're here to do, but also warns them since there's very heavy surf today, don't try to land, wait for us. We had a hard time and we're professionals. Wait for us. We'd be ashamed for you to survive this and then, then drown trying to get to shore. Captain Johnny then takes surf boat 1046, five miles offshore and begins to circle this wall of flames. And this part sounds like a Hollywood movie, but it's not. All of a sudden, there's an opening through the smoke and fire. Through that opening, he sees a capsized lifeboat. Without hesitation, Captain Johnny turns surfboat 1046 through that opening. When they reach, when they reach the, o the overturned lifeboat, this is what they find. Six men coming up from underneath scraping the flames aside to gasp another few seconds of air and going back under. The first time I ever heard that, I wondered, what if they're five miles offshore? What are a few more seconds? That you don't have a chance. I want to believe, I don't have any proof for this, but I want to believe that the United States Life Saving Service was so well known at that point, they were national heroes, that those men knew there was somebody around very close that were going to save them. And sure enough, they were plucked out of their worst nightmare and put into surfboat 1046. Their ordeal was over. They should have been getting out of there at great haste, but they, they weren't. They couldn't understand that surfboat 1046 was still lolling around. You see, what happened is Captain Johnny knew full well that lifeboat would have not been launched with six people. It would have had a full crew, which it did. So he's looking for the rest of the survivors. When the British sailors finally realized what Captain Johnny's doing, they say, Captain Johnny, we saw our shipmates go down. They never came back up. Please, let's get out of here. Even with that knowledge, Captain Johnny and his crew continued to look for survivors in the midst of an inferno five miles offshore because that's what they do. Finally realizing there were no more survivors, he goes back through that wall of flames. Hopefully we're on our way home. Not so fast, Captain Johnny. When our ship broke in two, we saw 19 of our shipmates on the stern, the back part. Of course, it was engulfed in flames and it was going down like a rock. But if there is a ray of a sliver of hope, here it is. That's where the captain's launch is kept. Now, in many reports I've read, that's referred to as a lifeboat. It's a mistake. It's not a lifeboat. It's a small vessel meant for the captain and a few crew. A lifeboat will hold 18 or 20. This will hold four or five. Of course, they're desperate. That's all they have, and they use it. As soon as it hits the water, they're in serious trouble. It's way too overloaded. On top of that, it's so heavy that there's no room to row, and the only way they can go is which way the wind is blowing, and the wind is blowing them south. Well, Captain Johnny now has a new piece of information. So he takes surfboat 1046 with his, his crew of five and the six survivors. And they go another mile south looking for these 19 men. And then three miles. And then six miles. Nine miles later, they come upon a small boat with 19 men. Covered in oil, bruised, battered, beaten, but alive. They take that boat into tow come the nine miles back against the wind and begin to unload the survivors. It took them four trips. By nine o'clock that night, 41 English sailors are alive on the sands of Patterson Island due to the impossible heroics of the men of the life-saving service. But that's not the end of the rescue. It never is. There's all still so much to do. And they did that. And I read the actual rep report written by John Allen Midget Jr. And it gives a lot of details, including everything I've said. But the second to last line of his actual personal report is so very telling and, and so very moving. Many times I try to quote that in public and, and I get choked up. So it may happen again. He writes, remember this, the first, they launched at, at 4, 4.30. He writes, Return to station 11 p.m., myself and crew very tired. 
That's the end of the report. I mean, can you get more understatement than that? That's an example of what's in many of the rest of these chapters. The uh, the next chapter, Rasmus Midget, and the the Mer how many of you have ever heard the name Mid the last name Midget? Yeah, there you go. Uh, I made this up, and I love to say it. We say the midgets are big around here. Thank you, ma'am. Um, it is is a, a very great uh, life saving service and Coast Guard name. Rasmus Midget uh, in this chapter, and it's a great chapter, saved 10 people single-handedly in the middle of the night, in the middle of a hurricane, after spending the previous all day on another rescue. But somehow, America forgot. Uh, most of us now are familiar with Richard Ether and the E.S. Newman, the all-black crew. Uh, chapter six talks about the G.A. Kohler. Parts of the J.A. Kohler are still on Harris Island. And one of the more interesting factoids about that is the J.A. Kohler was the, it's a six, it was a six-masted schooner, the largest schooner ever to wreck on the Outer Banks. Chapter seven is where I did something a little different. Um, I talk about the HMS Bounty. Actually, it's not the HMS because it was, that's the, uh, His Majesty's ship. This was the replica built for the Marlon Brando, is that right, movie. Uh, of 1960, so it was not. It was, it was just the bounty. You all, you all probably remember when the bounty sank in the hurricane. Which one was it? It was 2012. I can't remember which hurricane it was. Anyway, that was a very personal story for me because that morning, my wife Linda, which is right there, and I were getting ready to uh, go to work, and um, she always had the Today Show on TV, and so we're drinking coffee and eating donuts, whatever, on our way out. And the news is on, and uh, it's, it's a stormy day. And uh, I hear the guy say, and the, uh, the ship bounty has just gone down off the, the coast of Paris Island. And we stopped in our tracks, and I looked, and I said, what did he say? And she said, the, the bounty is, is sinking. I said, not that bounty. Well, yes, it was that bounty. And come to find out, and it's a long story, it's, it's in the chapter here, but it's a pretty good part. I ended up meeting some of the people that did the rescue and got some very firsthand knowledge of it. But unbeknownst to me, I still didn't know really what was going on at that point. But as I were, again, on our way to work. So I walk out the door, and as I open the door on my house on Harris Island, there's a, J, a Coast Guard Jayhawk H-60 helicopter about treetop level going over my house. That was one of the two helicopters that made the rescue. So I always felt really, really connected to that. And I talk about that in the, the story. Chapter eight is again, a little bit different. Uh, it's not just ships and rescues. I talk about the Queen Anne's Revenge and the discovery of that. Um, it had been a, a mystery for many, many years and highly debated. And come to find out, and uh, I didn't know this till I started my research on it, Come to find out it was finally found after however many years in 10 feet of water off of Beaufort Inlet. <laughs> 10 feet of water. Amazing. Section three, I start talking about I, I, a number of different shipwrecks called the lesser known. And uh, chapter nine, for example, is one of my very favorites. It's about uh, Dunbar Davis. He was the keeper of, a, of an Oak Island station down south of uh, Wilmington. And the short version of that story is he, he spent 55 consecutive hours responding to five different shipwrecks, mostly all by himself, no sleep, no food, no water. And we forget. Uh, chapter 10 is about the Aaron Report. That was the shipwreck that Rasmus and other people were working on the day before he did the one on the uh, Priscilla. Chapter 11 is one of my favorites, again, because it's a story of the Ephraim Williams. And the Coast Guard uses um, a quote from the annual report that was written about this. I think it was 1888, somewhere in there. Um, an inspector, uh, inspectors always came after these reports were issued and to follow up and make, get all the details. And uh, he was so impressed by, <laughs> These men had been followed, they spent like three days on the beach following this ship as it kept bobbing along, going from one place to the next. And 
again, without much sleep or, or rest or food. And finally, uh, they, they bring in uh, all the, the survivors and, and the, 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 the sea was so heavy, they couldn't even see the shipwreck. It was like five miles offshore. Anyway, they finally get all that. And this, the, uh, this inspector was so moved and so impressed by, by the courage of these men. He, he, he used the phrase, these poor lonely dwellers upon the sands of Hatteras, risking their own lives all for what? So that others may live. And that's a, a very famous uh, quote that the Coast Guard used to, to this day. That was the story of the Ephraim Williams. Um, and then in uh, the next section, um, I'm going to skip chapter 12. That, that was a shipwreck on Ocracoke, which is really before the days of, um, of the lifesaving service. But I used it because there were something like 90 people on board this, this ship, and it had two lifesavers. And guess, to, guess, guess how many people survived that? Um, so that's, you know, saying what the life service service and the Coast Guard warns us about today. The next section I call the almost unknown. And uh, it starts with chapter 13, the tiger. A lot of you from around here will know that the tiger was uh, Saint, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh's flagship for the, uh, the, the Roanoke voyages for the English settlements. He sent over one in 1584 to, to scout out the place. Then he sent out the second one in 1585. That was to be an actual colony. And that gets very confusing because, because of commercialization. That is not the lost colony. That's a whole nother colony in 1587. I'm talking 1585. This group, and when we hear the, and I'll write about this in the book, when we hear the word colonists, we think of pilgrims and <laughs> Puritans. These were soldiers, okay? The whole idea of that colony was to set up a military base to steal the gold from the Spanish ships that are heading back to Spain. Well, it didn't work because when they get to Ocracoke, the captain of the ship runs it aground. The Tiger is the flagship. It has most of the supplies on it. Most of those get ruined. The plans all change. There's not enough food for the three, 300 soldiers. So they have to leave just a hundred and they can't do, they can't set up the military base that they were going to do. So they say, well, what do we do while we're here? Well, let's just explore. And that's when they put the guy in charge called Ralph Lane and Ralph Lane, I call it uh, the, the subtitle for that chapter is calamity lane. He was this um, um, homicidal maniac. Uh, he just enjoyed killing people and he, he made war on every English tribe, every Indian tribe he ran into. And just to give you one example, he burned one village to the ground, including their crops, because he thought they might have stolen a silver cup from him. In another village, he uh, he heard that the that tribe was conspiring against them, which they probably were by this point. So he uh, captured the chief, had him beheaded, and put that head on a post for public display. But you can imagine what the Native American reaction to all this was, to the next group of settlers and to the next group of settlers. And then, of course, now innocent are fighting the innocent. And to this day, like I say, one shipwreck and one fool has caused tremendous harm to our, our, our nation. That's the Tiger, 1585. Uh, an almost unknown event because we focus on the so-called lost colony, which was not lost. Uh, chapter 14, the Sarah J. D. Rawson. Another example, that, who's gonna hear about this? These guys were, the entire crew was um, suffering from flu. They had to get out of their beds because of the shipwreck. And it's in the middle of the night, it's in the middle of a storm. And it's freezing, and they spend the night out on the on, in the sea, waiting to get closer to the ship because the sea, surface so high. And of course, they they uh, save everyone. Chapter fifteen, I talk about my other favorite subject, the Wright brothers. I always like to say there are two great stories on the Outer Banks. There's the life saving service and the Wright brothers, and actually, those two stories are connected. Um, a lot of people don't know that when, uh, when Wilbur, who was the primary genius behind this whole thing, first found a place to stay, he did stay in Kitty Hawk, but that first year of 1900, but he very soon found a, a better place four miles to the south. 
it, it was not a town, it was just a bunch of hills. There were four hills, in fact, and they were called the Kill Devil Hills. And right there was one of the United States Life Saving Service stations. So um, Wilbur realized, wow, here's some, some free help. <laughs> And, and the point I like to make in the book is this, and you don't hear much about this. I mean, we hear all about the 1903 flight, but they succeeded in 1902. That's where they learned all the secrets because they had taken a thousand glides off a big Kill Devil Hill in, in a matter of a few months. And in, in fact, in two particular days, two days, they did 250 glides. And so in the book, I say, guess who was toting that 117-pound glider up the hill all those times? You think it was Will and Orr? I don't think so. Um, and, but they had to be very low-key about this for several reasons, and I go into that. And I won't go into that now. But again, that's a little-known story. My contention, and this is my personal opinion, the Wright brothers would have succeeded they probably would not have succeeded as quickly as they did had it not been for the help of the United States Life Saving Service. The next section, uh, section six, section five, I go into uh, the mysterious, everybody likes a mystery. So I found two, two good stories. Um, one is pretty well known, the Carol A. Deering. Y'all heard of that? The ghost ship of Diamond Shoals. It's a great story. It really is a mystery. At, uh, at we, the centennial was just this past January, erect on uh, January 31st, um, 1921. And uh, it had been, the, the storm was so heavy, the co it's now the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard took four days to get out to it. And when they did, you know, you probably heard most of this story. They, the sails are all set, there's food on the table, uh, the lifeboats are gone, all the instruments are gone. It's buried 14 feet. The keel is 14 feet into the sand. 14 feet. Must have had a tremendous work to do that. And they found nobody. And, and to this day, the, the FBI, the Department of State, and the, the U.S. Congress, and, and um, the Navy, and the Life Savings, or the Coast Guard, all did extensive uh, investigations. Never found a thing. Still don't know. Uh, the, the last section is section six, and I entitled that Dramatic Failures. I'm such a, a proponent of these heroes. I want to talk about all and only the good stuff, but I know that's not true. They, they had a remarkable record, but I don't want to make it sound so, uh, you know, so good that it's unbelievable. They, they had failures. Uh, and most of these were um, uh, things that they had absolutely no control over. But I go into those. I talk about, um, well, chapter 18, I start with the, uh, the RMS Titanic. <laughs> I guess you've heard of that one. And uh, there have been so many movies on lately and documentaries. Um, did you know that um, the most common, and I, I've been watching this, it's true, it's, you know, almost everything you read, the most common fact you read is that the first distress signal was at 1140 that night from the Titanic. There's a telegram in the graveyard of the Atlantic Museum in Hatteras Village that has the time 1125 that says, we're sinking, come help from the Titanic. When that message was received, the operators at the Hatteras weather station sent it to New York New York chastised these guys and said, you fools, everybody knows this ship is unsinkable, so quit playing around and messing with us. There was another distress signal sent at 1140. They received that one too. They ignored that because they had been chastised so severely and did not forward it to New York. Had those messages been received at 1125, it is very likely 1,500 more people would have been alive. Uh, so that was a dramatic failure. The uh, USS Huron and the Metropolis are the two best known wrecks on the Outer Banks that were dismal failures. And I'm not going to even start to go into this. There's so much drama in that. Um, 
the, the, when I, the lead sentence paragraph in when I first started writing about the Huron, I said, if a Hollywood writer had taken this story and used it as his script line, people would say that's way too exaggerated. Nobody's going to believe that. But it was true. Uh, chapter 21, I talk about the Central America. Um, the ship of gold uh, sank several hundred miles off of the Carolina coast. Uh, this was in 18, 1857. And even though it was a ship full of gold, and that's enough interest, you probably don't realize what it led to. It led to the panic of 1859 because that it, it had half of the U.S. gold supply. That in turn led to the disastrous election of 1860 when the country was already divided against itself and that in turn led to the Civil War. A lot of it connected to this shipwreck. And then um, I talk about the uh, Nouveau Octavia, which happened up in Currituck. Sad, sad story. Uh, we, we don't really know what happened there, but the entire crew was drowned as they tried to save uh, an Italian bark, and the best the best information we have is that the crew and the keeper were fairly new, and we're thinking maybe they just didn't know what they were doing. And it, I hate to say that out loud, and I hate to write about it because these were all heroes. But you know, um, people make mistakes. And the last chapter again is kind of coming full circle. It's the Strath Harley. It also was a wreck at Chickamacomico. So I started with the Merlot at Chicken Comco, in with the Strath Harley. And it was a, they lost almost every one of those. They saved a few, but it, the storm was so intense. The people were, the, and, and the fog was so heavy. The lifesavers could not see to where they were to, to go out to help them. And so they, they spent like more than it was over a day and the, and the ship is getting battered. And finally the people on board are, are going crazy and literally going crazy. And they start jumping off the ship. Well, when that happened, the lifesavers couldn't stand seeing what they were seeing. So they start going in the water to, to save them. And, and most everybody drowns in doing that, but it was because of forces way beyond their control. Um, that is basically what's in this book. Um, because of the pandemic, this book was released on, uh, by Glow Pequot Publishing on March the 6th, 2020. <laughs> I don't know if you remember March 2020, <laughs> but a few days later, <laughs> uh, the world shuts down. So I, I, I would have been doing this a year ago. So all of us had to wait. And so while I was waiting, I've written 27 more chapters for a sequel, uh, which is not going to be published yet because we're just beginning to promote this book. Um, and then I've started written, writing some more. It's, it's just a fascinating subject. There's so many things to write about. Um, and I want to continue to, to wave the flag for the United States Coast Guard and the U.S. Life Saving Service. Uh, so at this point, I think I'll just uh, say my name's Keeper James, and I'm a storyteller. Okay, um, I don't know if someone might have a question. If you have a question, you can type it in the answer, and I'm going to step over here and see if we have any questions in the chat. So if someone at home might have a question, we will be glad to take it. You can either chat, to, um, chat into the chat session or the Q&A. Or if anyone in our audience today has a question. Yes, sir. The picture on the cover shows an overboat. I'm assuming that's the boat they used for the resting. Correct. Um, the sir, yeah, thank you. I hope, I hope y'all heard the question at home too. The surf boat, um, like the architecture of the stations themselves changed through the years. Uh, this was, um, I can't give you the exact date of, of, of that when they changed, but they, they, this was a 24 foot surf boat. And by the way, a surf boat and a lifeboat are two different things. And that's often confused. A lifeboat is a much larger, heavier, bulkier, not as maneuverable. They're used in places like in New England and the Great Lakes where, where the water isn't so rough. You, can, you can't launch a lifeboat 
off of Hatter's Island. The, the surf is way too heavy. So surf boats are lighter, more nimble, et cetera. These were open boats. Um, later, they got, uh, and they were powered by what the men called the Armstrong engines. Uh, <laughs> later, they were motorized, but still like that. And then somewhat later, especially the 36, the 36 lifeboat, and then now they're calling them lifeboats. And that adds to the confusion was enclosed. The hull looks almost exactly the same as that, but it is enclosed. The, uh, the movie, our, Their Finest Hours, showed uh, the 36 foot boat in that. Uh, you may ask other questions, only questions that I know the answers to. <laughs> Let me check. One more time. Okay. So it looks like, again, we would like to thank everyone today. We would like to thank Mr. James Charlet for um, battling the um, traffic coming up from the Outer Banks today and Miss Linda, his wife. We would like to thank her for joining us today, too. But again, um, we are 100% open. We're delighted that we have um, faces looking at us today and it's, um, and we're delighted that we are still able to have people to join us from home. If you would like to purchase the book and if you're at home, you can call Miss Mary Temple in the museum shop and her number is 252-331-4000. And she can make sure that you get a book um, mailed to your home. And if you would like to purchase a book today for our people that are joining us in person, um, they are available in the museum shop. And Mr. Charlet will be just outside at the high top table we have and will be available to sign them if you would like. Again, thank you to everyone for joining us today. Have a great day. And I have one more thing just for you guys, not for Zoom. Um, this is called History for Lunch. So the most appropriate dessert for history at, at lunch, of course, is a lifesaver. We have some for each other. <laughs> <laughs>